Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, and this is what it says. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among the robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road and when he saw him pass by on the other side and likewise, a Levite also and when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, but a certain Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them and put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend and when I return, I will repay to you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robber's hands? And he said to him, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Go and do the same. Go and do. Let's pray. Jesus, you tell us to go and do, not just to think, not just to feel, not just to believe. All those, those are all important things to go and do. With the power of your Spirit, Lord, may today be a, a day where we start to, to go and, and do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Earl was from the mountains of Tennessee, and the people all around that knew him knew him as a ne'er-do-well. That's what they called him. Yep. He was one of those folks that he tried to get by from doing as little as he could do. And if he could get out of doing it, he certainly would. Well, one day he received a draft notice. And when he went to, to have his physical for the military, he thought, well, maybe if I can convince the doctor that I have double vision, then I won't have to do that. He walked into the doctor where the doctor was giving the exam for his physical. The doctor said, do you see the, the chart on the wall? Earl said, yeah, but it's, it's all blurry. The doctor said, well, you passed. <laughs> Earl said, what do you mean I passed? I, I told you it was all blurry. He said, yeah, that was the hearing test. Well, life's got all kinds of tests, but very often those tests aren't what we think those tests are. This morning, the story starts off where a lawyer thinks he's testing Jesus. Well, we can be sure that 
most often when we think we're testing Jesus, that's not the test. We're the ones being tested. But it's a lawyer. A lawyer is testing Jesus. And he goes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's asking what he has to do. And he's asking along the right question. He's not just asking what do I do to be good. He's saying what do I do to inherit eternal life. Well, a case could be made that that is the theme that goes from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of the tree a knowledge of good and evil that basically humans know the difference between right and wrong. You don't need a relationship with God to know that murder is a bad thing. They did not eat from the tree of life. We don't know what life is apart from a relationship with God. That God says, you have life and death before you choose life. And it's that walk with God, that relationship with God is, is how we choose life. And it's Jesus who said, I have come that you might have life. And not just a little bit of life, not just enough of life to get by, but abundant life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is that that door to relationship with God. Life. That's what he's asking. What must I do to have life? Jesus points him in the right direction. What does Scripture say? And he says, love. God. He points back to that relationship. Love God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. There's a one and a two. Love God with all your strength, with everything you got and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, that's right. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. It's not something you just feel or think or believe. It's what you do. It's what you do. Do this and you'll have life. But I said the man's a lawyer. Well, lawyers look for loopholes. They look for exceptions. Uh, Yeah, loving loving everybody, certainly there's got to be an exception in there somewhere. I mean, after all, everybody is somebody's redneck. There's somebody out there somewhere is redneck enough where I don't have to love them, do I? I, after all, God's probably got an A list and a B list. Who are the B list people that I just don't have to waste my time on? That's how he comes back to Jesus. And Jesus answers with a story. I like what the gospel writers of Mark and Matthew say. Jesus didn't teach them anything without a story. And that's what he offers to us this morning. A story. Probably the most, the most well-known story in the Bible. And he starts this story with a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, any story that starts with they were on the the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, everyone listening in Jesus' day would know what kind of story this is. It's going to be an adventure story. That there are a lot of bandits on that road from Jerusalem to to Jericho. It would be like if I, if I started a, a story nowadays and said, well, I was traveling on Highway 400. You know it's going to be a heavy traffic story. St- having something to do probably with a car accident and with people driving crazy. Well, this was a, a high adventure story. It takes place on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And sure enough, true to form, that there was a, a man who fell among the robbers And they stripped him, and they beat him, and then they left him half dead. Well, the robbers, that's the first character that that Jesus has in this story. Robbers, they live their lives by what's yours is mine if I can take it. And that's the first attitude that I want to talk about. The attitude there of the robbers. What's yours is mine if I can take it. Clearly, half of the Ten Commandments can be broken with that one attitude. What's yours is mine if I can take it. Your stuff is my stuff if I can take it. It's called stealing. Your life is my my life if I can take it. It's called murder. Your wife is my wife if I can take her. It's called adultery. Your good name is mine if I can take it. If I can bear false witness, gossip, and lie about you. That not only that, 
Coveting. Coveting. That's the tenth commandment. Five of the Ten Commandments. Covenant. Well, what does coveting take from anyone? It's just wanting what someone else has. A case could be easily made that coveting is, is the first sin that opens to all the others. It was coveting that Adam and Eve saw that the fruit of the tree was desirable for food. It's coveting. That when Paul talks in, in Romans chapter 7, starts to talk about sin that, that enslaves us, that takes over our lives, he starts off talking about coveting. The first murder was coveting. That it was Cain that coveted the blessing that his brother Abel received. Well, what does coveting take from anyone? Coveting robs God. Robs God of the, of the praise, of the thanks, of the gratitude, of the blessing that God's already given us. It's coveting that says what God's given is not enough. What do I need? What's yours is mine if I can take it. And it's coveting that starts with, with robbing God of, of praise and of thanks. And that's where these robbers began. What's yours is mine, and if I can take it. And, and Jesus doesn't commend the robbers at all. And it's obvious, everybody knows. He's not holding them up as any kind of example to follow. He says, the next that come upon this, this man who is beaten and robbed and left half dead, it's a priest and a Levite. Well, they both do the same thing. They pass by on the other side. Well, what is a priest and a Levite? Priests and a Levite, both, their lives are consecrated to God. Not to just getting what they can and grabbing what they can. It's an attitude that, well, their lives were consecrated to God and they wanted to keep them consecrated to God and didn't want anybody else to get in the way of that. That the priests spent their lives sacrificing the animals that, that people came and, and gave to God. It was the, the Levite that spent their time in the administration of the temple, making sure that, they, that things went the way that God had prescribed them. And if they touched a man who was dead, not knowing whether he was dead or not, they wouldn't be able to do what God had called them to do with the way they had had consecrated their lives that it's the priest and the Levite who are living life with the attitude what's mine is mine and I intend to keep it most often good people don't start with that attitude that's what's yours is mine if I can take it most often the thing that tempts good people the most is what's mine is mine, and I intend to keep it. My time is my time. Don't ask me to give it to anywhere else. My stuff, it's my stuff. Don't ask me to give it anywhere else because it's, it's mine. My life is my life, and I'll live it the way that I want to live it. It's not as bad as the robber, but, you know, Jesus doesn't commend that either. Because it's a life that's spent, it's a life that's spent in control and managing life. What's mine is mine. And anybody who's spent their lives just managing and controlling their own stuff, their own time, their own things, that they know it's not much of a life at all. It's not an evil life, it's just not much of a life. And Jesus doesn't commend them. Next, he tells the story about a Samaritan. And that the Samaritan, he was on a journey, he came upon the man, and when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. And he came and he bandaged his wounds. He did something about it. He didn't just feel the compassion, just didn't think about it. It wasn't a theory of compassion. He bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and wine on his wounds. He, he put bandages on them. He placed him on his beast and he brought him to an inn. 
And there he paid the innkeeper to, to help him with whatever else he needed. That it's the Samaritan. The Samaritan who's the, the, the hero of the story. And we know it because we call the story the story of the good Samaritan. What we may not know is that it was just in chapter 9 that Jesus and his, had sent his disciples into a Samaritan village. And this little bitty verse at the end of chapter 9 says, and they did not receive him. That it was the Samaritans that had treated Jesus and the disciples badly. So badly that James and John pulled Jesus aside and said, hey Jesus, do you want us to call down the fire from heaven? You know, let's just kill them all, let God sort them out. Isn't that the kind of thing? That's how bad they, they treated Jesus and his disciples. And now the very next story Jesus tells is a story where the Samaritan is the hero of the story. He doesn't just feel compassion. He goes and he does something about it. It's an attitude that says what's mine is yours because you need it. Bobby was 12 years old before he heard the words, I love you, for the first time. That Bobby, Bobby's mother was 15 years old when Bobby was born. She spent most of her time in seedy bars and flop houses, leaving her children to fend for themselves. She'd bring home men. They would smack Bobby and his brothers and sisters around. And Bobby was the oldest, left to take care of his brothers and sisters as best he could, being a child. And when the Department of Family and Children's Services intervened, Bobby and his brothers and sisters were living in squalor, living off of ketchup sandwiches. The family was split up, and they were sent to different foster care homes. Bobby was what the authorities called damaged goods. Anyone that wanted to adopt him, they told him, but well, you can't help Bobby. He's damaged good. Institution is about the only way that can help him. Well, Mary and Arnold Peterson didn't believe that at all. So they took Bobby in when Bobby was 12 years old. They wanted to show him kind of love that they had received as children growing up. Mary put her arms around Bobby, and for the first time when Bobby was 12 years old, she told Bobby, I love you. She adopted him. And that's when Bobby began to change. He began to change a little at a time by the love of the, the Petersons had shown for them, for him. But when he was in college, it was the college chaplain that told Bobby that God has chosen us to be a part of his family. Well, Bobby knew what it was like to be chosen to be a part of a family. And if God had done that for him, he wanted to receive Jesus as the one to lead his life, to be the one to be Lord of his life. And so he received Jesus, and that's when his, his life began to change. And that's what Jesus does for you and for me. It's what he did on the cross that he received us into his family, that on the cross, Jesus gave his life to break down all the barriers that would separate us from God, to make us right with God. He gave his life on the cross to take away the sin, to take away the shame, to take away the fear, to, wait, to take away all those things that would separate us from God. And he rose. He rose on the third day to live his life through us. That we would always have power over the sin, over the shame, over the fear. It's a forgiveness of, of all that's past. It's a forgiveness over all and power over all that we're battling through now. And it's a forgiveness for all that would be. That's what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. And Bobby's life began to change. And began to change fairly quickly. That Bobby went from being called Bobby to being called Dr. Robert Peterson. 
being called pastor, to being called author, to being called president of Master Media International. It was Jesus, Jesus, who changed Bobby's life. And Jesus still changes lives today, and he uses the church to do it. That's you and me. We're the ones called to, to go and to do. Not just to feel, not just to think, not just to have warm theories and thoughts, but to go and to do. And church, that's what we're called to do. As God's family, to reach out. Every week we show a, 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 a short video during worship of, of compassion and community. And it's the way God has used ordinary people here in this church that we can see evidence of God. Reaching out, sometimes it's a child, sometimes it's youth, sometimes adult. And it's right here in this place that so far this year, 55 young people have made a first-time commitment to Jesus Christ during one of our retreats. It's right here that God calls us as his family to go and do, where lives are changed, that each week 250 families are given groceries. Here, through this church, our, our My Neighbor's Pantry program with Must Ministries is joined together and and we help feed families during this time of inflation. Families that are struggling to make ends meet. Not only that, but we've partnered with elementary schools and high schools to tutor children who have English as a second language. That's not somebody else. Church, that's, that's you and that's me. Job networking. We meet to help folks find a job. A little while back, I was at Home Depot. I was checking out. It was a slow day, and I struck up a conversation with the, the woman that was there at the checkout. I invited her to the church on Sunday, and she had a quizzical look on her face, and then she recognized. She said, yes, I know that church. You gave me clothes for a job interview. And she said, they weren't just any clothes. They were good clothes. And then she turned to the fellow next to her. You need to go to his church. They helped me find this job and help get me this interview. It's not just job networking. And it's not just here. It's Peru. It's Honduras. It's Venezuela. We help people with medicine and food. The poorest places on earth. It's in Kenya. We've helped start Divine Providence that helps train pastors to go out all over the country that people may know what life in Jesus Christ, to experience that life, a life that we can't get any other way than a relationship through Jesus Christ, that this church has a long history of helping older adults who've outlived their financial resources, more than a million dollars we've given through Wesley Woods to help older adults who've outlived their financial resources. It's why in a few days you'll be receiving a letter from the church about our commons project. It's a project right here at the church to provide a, 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 a reworked grassy area and, and, and space for community and faith. Yes, it's a door into the church. And yes, it's a door out into the community. A space where people can, can learn in that relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a space, yes, where people can receive help they need. Maybe a space for support groups. And yes, it's a place right here, consecrated, set aside, saying Christ has led us safe thus far and, and Christ will lead us home. It's a life. It's a life. A life that together we're a part of, of God's family, letting the world know who Jesus is. And, and in that relationship, we say what 
What's mine is yours because you need it. And this morning, I want to invite you to go and do. To give and to give freely. To give joyfully. To give with a heart of gratitude. There's a world that needs to know that they belong to a family, the family of God. And and church, that's you and me together. We're called to go and do. Pray with me. Jesus, we need your power and we need your strength to go and do. It's something we can't do on our own. There are a lot of things that are tempting us to to step back in fear and to hang on, to say, well, what's mine is mine and I intend to keep it. Jesus, you have more for us than that. You have a life, a life that says, no, what we have, well, it's yours because you need it. Grant us power, grant us grace, strength enough to let go and to give freely to you. Lord, with the power of your Holy Spirit, give us those eyes that see the need out into a world that needs to know who you are. Give us hands that have the power to go and to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.